Tom, you've written a book called How We Know What Isn't So. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, the book, the purpose of the book was to try to understand how is it that we can look at all the evidence that we encounter in our everyday life and come to some conclusion. The world's telling me this thing that's true. It's obvious that it's true. But if you look at it a little more dispassionately, uh, some of those beliefs are very questionable. I mean, everyone's familiar with the idea that people believe what they want to believe. Those are some important kinds of erroneous beliefs. The book is not so much about that. It's about um, thinking that we really have the evidence uh, for things. The world is telling us something. But in fact, the world's telling us something a little more complicated. And uh, how is it that we can misread the evidence of our everyday experience and be convinced that something's true when it really isn't? That was the thesis of the book. Uh, what do you mean by erroneous beliefs? What are some of the examples that you have in the book? Uh, well, one is, well, there are a variety. But uh, take, for example, the pretty common belief that things happen in threes you know, natural disaster. So if, if two of them have happened in close proximity, people will sometimes tell you, oh my god, I wonder what the third one is going to be, or homicides, or a fatality on the part, fatalities on the part of famous people. Um, if you look at all of those things, they don't tend to cluster in threes at all. And so why do people believe those uh, kinds of things? Uh, um, there's a belief in the sports world and something called the Sports Illustrated Jinx. You get your picture on the cover of Sports Illustrated, uh-oh, that's a terrible thing. Your, uh, whatever success got you there is, unlike, is unlikely to continue. Um, that's, a, that's been shown to be false uh, as well. Another belief in the uh, so-called sophomore jinx. You've been exceptional as uh, a first-year performer, a rookie, uh, and the thought is that if you've done really well your first year, um, you're, you're jinxing yourself. Um, or more common kinds of things, you're at uh, a grocery store, you're, the line you're in is really bogged down, going nowhere, there's someone in front of you with a million coupons sifting through them or can't get their change organized, and the line right next to you is zipping through. And you're tempted to go to that line, why stay in this slow one when there's a faster line over there, and many of us often think, oh, Wait a minute, I know that if I do that, that line's going to slow down and, mm -hmm. and this one's going to speed up. I don't know what principle of the universe would create that, um, but it's kind of easy to understand, and that's what we explore uh, in the book, is why do we believe that the lines we go to slow down and the lines we lead, leave uh, speed up if there's no evidence for it? So beliefs of, of that sort. And then you can take those kinds of things and apply them to people's beliefs about uh, a variety of um, uh, alternative medical practices, some of which are, have been shown to be um, valid and useful, a lot of them shown not to be, and why do we believe every bit as much in some of the ones that don't work as the ones that do, um, belief in supernatural things, uh, extrasensory perception, etc. So tell me, you said that there's not much evidence for a lot of these, these folk myths and these uh, alternative health therapies, etc. So why do we believe these strange things in the absence of, of data or, or evidence to the contrary? Yeah. Um, well, there's a whole bunch of reasons. There's not a, a single answer to this. If there was a single answer to it, we could easily teach that to people in school and then it would be gone but a whole bunch of things conspire to it. One of them, and most of them, um, are sort of a side effect of this impressive intellectual machinery that we have in our heads. Part of its job is to identify patterns out there. It's hard to get that uh, job accomplished perfectly, so people look out there for patterns and they're often gonna see things that uh, really aren't there. And if you go on the internet and type in you know, illusions, you'll see all sorts of them, people spotting um, faces in clouds or faces in a cinnamon bun or uh, what have you. If you take, for example, grab a bag of M&Ms, pour it in a jar and you look at it, um, and they're, the different colors are randomly arranged, they don't look random. It's just like, oh, there's a bunch of blue ones over there and a bunch of green ones over there. We sort of see order uh, where there isn't any. So we can see things happening in three. We organize things into certain clusters that are really the kind of clusters that you'd see by chance.
So formally, what are the other kinds of cognitive mechanisms that are operating uh, when we have these beliefs or opinions? Yeah. I think one of the most powerful and most interesting ones is something that a colleague, a former student here at Cornell, Scott Lillianfeld, calls the mother of all biases, um, known as the confirmation bias. And that's a term that most people are familiar with. Uh, and they're familiar with the idea that um, if we want to believe something, we'll go and seek out evidence for it, and we won't seek out evidence against it. That is really true. Um, it's a very pronounced tendency to treat information that's consistent with what we want to believe in a pretty friendly way and be really hostile to information that's consistent with something we don't want to believe. It's almost as if we ask ourselves, of something that we want to believe. Uh, can I believe this? Or is there evidence for this? And there's evidence for almost anything, even the most outlandish things. There's some evidence for it. The question is, is there enough evidence? Is there sufficient evidence? And we don't tend to ask ourselves, you know, must I believe this? Is there enough evidence here? So all of that's true. All of people can relate to that. But it's even more pronounced than that. That is, even if you don't care about a particular belief, you have no vested interest in it, you tend to look for evidence consistent with the idea rather than information that's inconsistent with it, which, of course, if we want to have a balanced picture, we've got to look at both. So if I asked you, um, I gave you some plants, a bunch of hostas, and said, here's some, here's some, you're a nice guy, here's some extra hostas from my garden, I think they probably need a lot of water, but you might want to test that. How would you test that? Well, if you're like most people, you'd give it a lot of water and see how they do. Uh, what you wouldn't do is give some a lot of water, some hardly any water at all, and see which one does better. You look for evidence for it rather than against it. And that's a very natural tendency. At some level, it makes sense because it reflects a, a broader belief that, look, if this thing's true, there must be some evidence for it, so let me look for some evidence for it. You're doing a very reasonable thing. However, you're doing an incomplete thing as well. You need to look not only for evidence for something, but evidence against it. So if you believe that um, cheerful people are more likely to overcome uh, a bout of cancer. Um, you need to lo look not just who are the cheerful people you know who've done very well, but maybe you know some dour people also who've uh, recovered. Uh, that's the latter step that we tend uh, not to do. It sounds like you're talking uh, formally about a contingency table there. It sounds a lot like signal detection theory. So you yes. have to look at uh, how else it could have turned out. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, well, a lot of our beliefs are ultimately beliefs about relationships. Uh, is there a relationship between your personality and your health? Is there a relationship between your personality and the health of your marriage? Um, is there a relationship between whether basketball players have uh, how they've performed in the past and how they're likely to perform uh, in the future? And to evaluate any relationship, you need to look at all the levels of one and how it stacks up with all the levels of the other. We tend instead to look at the presence of one and the presence of the other. A positive personality makes you happier. We look for all those positive people who are happy. Um, I start out the book with this example that um, a lot of people have heard of, that infertile couples, couples who are trying to conceive a child, um, and are having some difficulty, they're often told, oh, adopt a child, and you'll be more likely to, you'll, you'll have this delightful adopted child, and then you'll be more likely to conceive your own biological child as well. Uh, turns out that's been studied uh, to death. There's no evidence for that. But it's easy to see why you would think it, because the world is going to give you lots of that information. All the cases that confirm it will come to your attention. When someone adopts and then conceives, that's a story. You'd tell that story, I'd tell that story, we hear that story, and it just seems like it's true. We're not going to tell a story about, or it would be a very different story, about people who adopt a child, and that's it. They've now got this great family with the adopted child. That's a different story than doesn't get tied into the notion of the relationship between adoption and conception. Is it as simple as us just disregarding the evidence that contradicts our beliefs, or just ignoring it, or forgetting it? Um, well, almost nothing is, is, uh, is terribly simple with uh, humanity, which is uh, why it's kind of fun and interesting to be a psychologist. Um, there are times when we 
willfully put on the blinders and we say, oh, I, just, I just don't believe it. I don't care what the evidence. But, uh, and that's true and that's important. But I think even more interesting are the times we're really trying to get the story right. And uh, nonetheless, our thinking isn't perfect and we end up drawing erroneous conclusions. Another way of thinking about this or thinking about the different kinds of biases to which we're prone is that, look, there's this big giant world out there and we have to look at it through a very small um, you know, peephole, if you will. And that's true at any scale that you want to think about. First of all, it's literally true. I've got this world around I can only see a little more or a little less, depending on what you're counting, than 180 degrees of the 360. If I'm trying to draw on the information that's stored in my head, I can only keep seven or so items of information in mind at any one time. Um, advertisers talk about things in certain terms. You're going to lose this amount of money if you don't do this, or you'll gain this amount of money if you do this. That channels, I just accept the terms they've used. I think about the problem in terms of those terms, and that's a narrow kind of focus, all the way up to the kind of ideologies that you have. If you're a political conservative, you see the world, literally see the world one way that's different than the world if you're politically liberal. So no matter what scale you're talking about, we're only seeing some portion of the world, and that uh, introduces all sorts of opportunity for bias and misconception. Are there any uh, formal tools or procedures from science and statistics that we can steal and, and use in our everyday thinking? Oh yeah, I think so. I, and I think um, you know, people, or another form of that question, you could say, is that, look, um, administrators at universities are always saying, it doesn't matter the content what you learn in college. That's not what a university education is for because the content's going to change. It'll be outdated in 10 years anyway. College is the place where you learn how to think. OK, great. So how do I learn how to think? Uh, what would be the best courses to take? Should I take statistics courses? Should I take rhetoric courses? Sure, all of those are really good. However, and you should view this skeptically because I'm a psychologist. This is a self-serving claim here. But taking psychology courses is very um, is at least as valuable as any other because when you look at the research in psychology, you're always dealing with the second best, at best, the second best data set. You know, we're dealing with messy kind of data all the time. We're having to overcome certain kinds of problems. We can't do the ideal experiment that we'd like to do. Uh, so you get used to understanding what are some of the limits on the kinds of inferences that you can make. So when you study psychology, you, uh, you really get trained in not mistaking correlation for cause. You really get trained in um, uh, you know, the fact that, um, I don't know how much jargon to use here. You, know, you get trained in selection biases that you know, this sample of people that you're looking at in this condition, they weren't randomly assigned to that condition. And so how they were treated may not be the, uh, what's determined their response, but who they are that led them to get that uh, treatment is what's uh, responsible for it. You learn a little bit about not uh, committing the confirmation bias. Uh, you develop the habits to sort of say, OK, that's the evidence for this. Now what's the evidence against it? Uh, and that's uh, helpful as a scientist. It's helpful if you're trying to run a corporation or a nonprofit or anything in life to have those kinds of habits. And I think psychology teaches that very well. Uh, are psychologists and scientists then immune to uh, erroneous beliefs? No, not at all. Uh, and uh, sometimes we're even, we knowingly um, give in to our erroneous beliefs. So there's this research on the interview illusion that if I'm trying to uh, predict who's going to be a good doctor, who's going to be a good professor, uh, it's very hard from a, sample, a little conversation that we're going to have to uh, predict who's going to be successful or not. So you might think that we'd say, well, let's not have those. If they're a waste of our time, why have them? We all do them. We interview people we, you know, for people to be graduate students to join our lab or people ending their graduate careers come and give job talks. And whether we decide to hire someone or not is enormously influenced by these little half hour conversations that we have that probably aren't that predictive of anything. So we know that, and yet we still do it. So no psychologists are not immune to that. Um, which again is one of the reasons that 
this whole area of research on heuristics and biases, judgment and decision making, is, uh, has drawn such interest is that people recognize themselves in these kinds of mistakes. So when Kahneman talks about you pay more attention to losing things than gaining things, you see those examples and you go, yep. You don't even need to show me any data. I know, yeah, that's it. I, everybody I know would do exactly that thing. Um, so. Can you give me some specific examples um, from maybe belief in ex extra sen extrasensory perception uh, or alternative health practices where a lot of the, um, the mechanisms are going on that you've explained? Um, well, there's, yeah, one of the, you know, most pronounced kind of biases is... Um, if something happens right after something, uh, they co-occur in time, we tend to think that they happened because of that something. Uh, so if you're feeling uh, ill in some ways, um, you're, when do you seek treatment? When you're really at your worst. And so I give you some treatment. It could be a completely worthless treatment. Chances are your body is designed to make itself better. So if you see me when you're feeling the worst, chances are, Right afterwards, you're going to be feeling a little bit better. And because of this tendency, oh, I got better right after that guy gave me this treatment, you're going to think that that treatment uh, is effective. And that's a very powerful uh, conclusion to shake. It's so natural to think, look, I did this in order for this to happen. This happened. And then to say, well, that, no, that's just my body did it. That's very hard to, to realize that. It's very easy to jump to that conclusion. It sounds a little bit like regression towards the mean. Uh, regression to the mean, yes. It, that would be an example of that. Um, and uh, you see that going back to the Sports Illustrated jinx. You get pictured on the cover of Sports Illustrated when you're at your peak. And unfortunately, we can't stay at the peak, uh, <laughs> by definition, uh, endlessly. And therefore, if that's when you're pictured, chances are shortly afterwards you're not going to be doing as well. And that gives us all the, the data that we see out there that suggests, hey, there's a, it's bad luck to be uh, pictured on the cover of Sports Illustrated. No, it's not. It's just like, as you said, it's the uh, regression to the mean. Can you tell me about the intuitive scientist? Uh, sure. That's a, a, a metaphor that people have used to uh, draw a parallel between what scientists do, which is try to understand the world, and there are some formal tools for doing that. And what scientists try to do professionally, of course, we all try to do in our everyday lives to figure out the world around us. And there are uh, a lot of similarities between what we do uh, as uh, people in our everyday lives and what scientists do. In fact, science developed out of you know, the kinds of mental habits that uh, we had. We, over time, recognized which, what the problems are and what are the things that allow the most uh, powerful conclusion. So uh, it would be odd if regular thinking was just radically different than uh, scientific thinking. It's different, uh, but there are some parallels uh, between it. We're trying, just like the science scientist does, to identify what, what are the phenomena out there. Okay, there are the phenomena. Why, why are they that way? We, we ask why uh, all the time. You know, there used to be this beer commercial in the United States of why ask why. And it's a brilliant little tagline because it's by raising it, it's illustrating it. We just do that all the time. Uh, something happens and we want to know why. That's what scientists do and that's what we do uh, in our daily lives. What can we do to pick up on some of the mechanisms that are operating then uh, when we're dealing and evaluating claims, say, with uh, psychic claims or predicting of the future, for example? Um, well, um, Danny Kahneman has this take on the world that uh, I think helps us quite a bit, that uh, we have these intuitive reactions. Uh, we have this intuitive system that's going to register a bunch of associations, the things that go together in space and time. We're going to make, we're going to think of those things as connected. And uh, training in science, training in psychology is not going to make those go away. Uh, but we also have this other system, a rational reflective system, that allows you to inspect that and says, all right, is that really true or not? What have I been taught about what kind of inferences I can draw? And so uh, scientific education, 
um, you know, post-secondary education is all about training system two to sort of say, no, wait a minute, you're guilty of the confirmation bias here. Um, can't, I've explained it this way, is there another way to explain it? Um, or I've looked for this kind of evidence, is there evidence against it? So looking at psychics in particular, what makes them seem so successful then uh, in their predictions? Um, well, any time uh, a prediction is confirmed, it's just, it uh, you know, takes over your attention. It's a very dramatic thing. And what you see is that local event. Someone said this was going to happen, and now it happened. What you need to do is step back and say, all right, this one little data point here, where does that fit in in a broader pattern of evidence? And it's only if that's repeated a bunch of times that we really can trust it. So Carl Sagan, in one of his books, starts out uh, with an anecdote where he had a dream that his father had died and woke up. I, I may be exaggerating here, but at least as I remember it, he woke up in a sweat that, oh my god, my dad, i got to check in on him. He checks in on him and his dad was fine. Uh, and he said to himself that, um, look, if just so happened that I had that dream and uh, my dad had died, there's no way that anyone could have disabused him of the idea that he didn't have a prophetic dream. But in fact, we populate our dreams with familiar people. Familiar people die. And if you look at all the people in the world and how often we dream, there's going to be a bunch of times when that happens just by pure chance. But good luck trying to convince the individuals who've had those dreams or the people close to them that that was just one of this broad fabric of, uh, you know, pattern of noise. That's, you're just not going to convince them of that. Do we tend to think that other people have the same beliefs and opinions as we do? Um, sure, and it's easy to see why. Um, first of all, the beliefs that you hold, it's, it's very rare for people to hold the belief to go, yeah, I know this is completely at variance with the evidence out there. It's a crazy belief, but I hold it anyway. Rather, you have beliefs that are grounded in what seems like reality to you. And so whatever it is that makes you think this team is better than that team, this candidate is more likely to win than that candidate, all the causal forces you can think of that convince you that that's true, they're going to convince other people that's true, you reason, and therefore other people will believe that uh, as well. What we fail to recognize is that other people may be doing very different kinds of calculations and arriving at a very different uh, kind of result. So that would lead us to think that other people are going to believe, uh, will believe what we believe, but also uh, we don't randomly sample the world. Um, so if you're trying to predict what do Americans in general, uh, what does the world in general think, um, you only have the sample of people who you hang out with. And we tend to hang out with people who are a lot like ourselves. And that's going to give us a distorted view of how common uh, certain things are. So if you're politically conservative, you probably hang out with conservatives, you listen to Fox News, you get conservative messages all the time, and you're going to think the world is more conservative than it really is. Flip it to the other side, the exact same thing. Liberals are going to think uh, the world is more liberal than it actually is. So what is the correlation? What's the relationship between what we, what we think other people believe in and the other beliefs that are out there? Um, well, it varies from issue to issue, but uh, in general, that um, you know, there is a correlation between what we believe and what we think other people believe. That is this phenomenon known as the false consensus effect. We see more consensus for our beliefs uh, than is actually uh, the case. Um, and some of it is due to that kind of bias sampling. Some of it is due to how we resolve the ambiguity inherent in these kinds of issues that come up or the questions that were asked. Um, you know, what percentage of people are conservative? Well, what do I mean? To answer that question, I have to decide what I mean by conservative. Other people who are answering whether they're conservative or not may be defining conservatism differently than I am. And most people recognize not everyone agrees with them, so they make allowance for that. OK, I think this. Not everyone's going to think that. What it's harder to make allowance for is that I'm making a judgment about this thing. You may be making a judgment about a very different thing, even though we call it the same name. The social psychologist uh, Solomon Ash referred to this as, it's not so much that we have different judgments of an object, 
but we have different objects of judgment in mind. And you're making a judgment about one thing, I'm making a judgment about a very different thing. And unless we realize that, we're right. going to misunderstand each other. Does the world look different in hindsight? How does hindsight uh, affect our judgments? Um, well, that, that gets, that's a great question. It gets back to what you raised earlier about um, sort of the intuitive scientist. That is, we explain things all the time. And so when you say that something occurred, I don't just, okay, file it away, that occurred. I uh, you know, sometimes very explicitly and energetically explain it. Sometimes very automatically I get a little explanation of, for why that thing happened. And so now you ask me, um, how likely, um, suppose you didn't know that this happened, how likely is it that you would have predicted it? Well, now I thought of all the whole web of forces that created it, even if I try to take out the outcome, all those causal forces are there that imply the outcome. And so I think that, oh, this is really likely to be true. So once you know, stated differently, you know, the hindsight bias is one version of a broader phenomenon known as the uh, curse of knowledge. Once you know something, it's really hard to take it away and see what the world was like before you knew it, which is why teaching is hard. Once you know this stuff, be easy to teach it to people who already know it, but you teach it to people who don't know it, it's a little harder. You've got to get beyond your own perspective and uh, understand what it was like before you knew this. Before you knew the outcome, how likely is it that you would have predicted it? It's just very difficult to do. Is data or evidence alone sufficient to change people's minds or opinions? Uh, I think it can be. Um, you know, we're responsive. To, most people are responsive to evidence. Uh, at the same time, we are kind of storytelling creatures. If you look at you know the sacred text of the world, they aren't data tables. They're stories. Uh, they're narratives. Uh, you know, and there was an oral tradition, and we evolved in that oral. Uh, part of our evolution took place in that uh, oral tradition. So. Uh, narratives, we think in terms of cause and effect, which are embedded in narratives, those tend to move people uh, a lot better uh, than data do. So imagine if you're a, a, an attorney and um, you've got one side that's got a bunch of data over there uh, showing people the law of large numbers and how this pattern really has meaning and therefore my client is. And you have someone else who tells a really compelling story. Who are you going to bet on? Uh, well, I think we all know that um, humans really relate to a narrative kind of structure, which is why the you know, biblical parables, which again is one reason why uh, teaching psychology is so gratifying. There's, uh, it lends itself uh, to uh, storytelling. A lot of the classic experiments uh, are really parables. The parable of the person walking down the street uh, who ignored uh, people in need. Um, that literally comes from the parable of the Good Samaritan. Are there ways then to combine good data and evidence with a good story? Yeah, but you, you, know, you have to be careful there. That's, that's what um, good science writing, for example. We can go is, back is, into that uh, again if you like. <laughs> uh, that's what good science writing does is, uh, you know, takes the message from the data Really, the only way we can find out whether things are true is to subject them to empirical test. But then to get people to resonate to them, you need to take those conclusions, embed them into stories that people can relate to. And very good teachers do that. Um, very good uh, science writers uh, do that. It just makes it more compelling. Um, if you want to get people's attention, it's really good to have a you know, picture's worth a thousand words, of course. But uh, a story is worth maybe not a thousand, but a lot. Gotcha. This course is about the science of everyday thinking. Uh, what advice do you have uh, for people out there who want to think better and do better in their everyday lives? Uh, a couple of things. One is to recognize that um, we know much less than we think we know. Uh, is you know if I could. Uh, wave a magic wand and insert something in people's heads, it would be a certain kind of epistemological caution. Uh, people who think they've got everything figured out are almost always wrong. Um, and, uh, you know, overconfidence is massive and pervasive. And if you can make people 
a little less overconfident, if you got people to think that most things in life are shades of gray, when people want to scream over, no, it's black versus it's white, if you could get rid of that, I think you'd make a lot of human progress. My name is Tom. I think about superstition. Mm -hmm.